Welcome back. Based on the results of so many primary elections earlier this month, as well as public opinion surveys, it's clear that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party leadership has a problem with many of their progressive younger voters when it comes to Gaza and U.S. support for Israel. Joining us now is Fernando Guerra of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at LMU and Jessica Levinson, who teaches election law at Loyola Law School. So, Fernando, first to you. Uh, going back uh, in a week and a half to that speech on the floor of the Senate by Senate Majority Leader Charles Schumer, uh, where he called for new elections in Israel, uh, and he sort of con he, he condemned uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, saying he's too conservative, he's an autocrat. How much of that was about geopolitics and Israel and U.S. foreign policy, and how much of it was about uh, the problems Democrats are having with, some, with their younger voters? I think Schumer's uh, discussion about Israeli internal politics was uh, unusual in its directness, not unusual in that the United States is always interfering with Israel and Israel uh, the other way, but much more subtle. This was much more direct. And a large part of it is protecting that progressive flank. I think that's a large part of it. Uh, you know, young people just don't know the history of Israel uh, to the same degree. All they see is the current politics. And I would say that, you know, Netanyahu is an autocratic type of leader and he's been going to the right. And most, uh, I would venture to say, given uh, public opinion polling, that most American Jews do not feel that they re he represents their values on a lot of issues, with the exception of protecting the state of Israel, obviously. And so that, I think, was a large part of it. Um, the directness was surprising. The idea that the United States is trying to sway Israeli politics, not surprising at all. Jessica, weigh in on this. Uh, there's... Um... There's a, there's a concern that not they're not going to vote for Donald Trump, uh, many of these progressives, or we just uh, assume they won't. Uh, but, but you don't need them to vote for Donald Trump to turn the elections in Arizona and Nevada and Georgia and certainly in Michigan. Uh, all they have to do is stay home. And that is a loss. Let's be clear that if Democrats, particularly those in swing states, stay home, that is a problem. And we already saw what happened during the primaries, for instance, in Michigan, in part as a result of what is happening in Israel. So part of what Chuck Schumer is saying, I think, is so difficult in American politics today, which is he's trying to say something subtle and nuanced, which is, I can think that the attacks on October 7th were abhorrent, period, full stop, no ifs, ands, or buts. And I can also say that I do not support the head of the Israeli government and how he has responded to that. And I think the question really is, will people hear that nuance and will enough people who otherwise, as you said, might stay on the couch think, this is one of the highest elected officials in our government and the highest serving Jew in American government. Will they hear that and will that help assuage some of their concerns? I need you to address something because I still see it on social media uh, a bit. Podcasters with uh, with so-called experts talking about how, you know what, it's not going to be Joe Biden and Donald Trump in the fall. Uh, the Democrats are going to get rid of Biden at the convention and then superdelegates will choose uh, who the nominee will be in a closed door. Uh, that that simply is not going to happen. That's right. I didn't know Gavin Newsom had a podcast, but that's exactly right. It's going to be Biden and it's going to be Trump, barring something extraordinary. And by extraordinary, we mean some medical issue. We do mm -hmm. not mean some shadow campaign to ensure that Gavin Newsom, because he's younger, is the one who takes the mantle. And as we may discuss, Gavin Newsom is actually facing some approval problems at home in California. Why do you think Proposition 1 was so close? This is a $6.4 billion bond measure to, uh, to build out a mental health system for the state, which the governor says it desperately needs. Gavin Newsom was, was the face of that campaign. Uh, it, it had a very large lead uh, going into the last week of the election. Then it dropped and it barely passed. Uh, Fernando, why do you think that was? Uh, number one, I don't think it was understood. I, you know, given the the economic times, people thinking more taxes, even though it's not really about that, it's just shifting existing money. And it the messaging wasn't clear in my mind what this was and why it was important at this time and how much it really helps with homelessness and, and mental health. And I think, you know, to me, if you take a look at a public opinion, they would most. Californians would be actually very supportive of this. And so I think it was just a bad campaign the way it was run.
I totally agree with Fernando on Prop 1 in the sense that the number of people just anecdotally who you would think would have a strong position on this, who came to me and said, which way do you think I should vote? Or what exactly does this do? I also think that people feel, frankly, like, don't we keep pouring money into this problem and nothing comes of it? Should we really vote for this now new proposal as to Prop 1? So I... I mean, Conan, I think it's everything. I think it's Gavin Newsom not having these huge coattails and maybe not clearly explaining it to the voters. It's the voters being confused because it feels like this is on the ballot all the time. These weren't competitive primaries, and I don't think that people are hugely excited about the candidates. Fernando, let's talk about we had a low turnout election on Super Tuesday, but but de Democrats, progressive Democrats did well in Los Angeles County, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, it was a fantastic election. Every single one of their major candidates overperformed. There was a narrative that uh, Neat Councilwoman Nithya Raman in the 4th District was going to be forced into a runoff. She won outright. Uh, in the 14th District, uh, where we have Kevin De Leon and two sitting state legislatures running, a, a progressive uh, um, Jurado came in first. Uh, over in the second district, uh, a, a socialist Democratic uh, candidate came in second and will be, I think, competitive in, in November. And let's talk about George Gascon. Uh, he had 11 candidates against him. Yes, as an incumbent, he only got 25 percent, maybe 26 percent. You would think, think that he's in trouble, but he got the perfect uh, candidate against him, a, a well-known Republican, and he'll turn this into a Democratic Republican race in November. And I would think that right now he is the, uh, the, the favorite extremely well. It's a new kind of politics. Progressives in the past used to depend on high turnout elections. They've turned that around. They are actually more effective in low turnout elections because of their ground game. And so it, it's, it's a whole new uh, political reality playing itself out here in Los Angeles. Fernando Guerra of LMU and Jessica Levinson of Loyola Law School, thanks very much to both of you for joining us. Up next, the state of California has some very ambitious goals for becoming CO2 neutral in the fight against global warming and climate change. But a new report out recently indicates they are not getting there fast enough. That when we return.